Well, they definitely did transform the novel. Mm-hmm. So if you, I suppose if you object to that, then everything's going to be wrong. Yeah, I, I would have preferred it if they were like, oh, we're going to set this in, in in Iraq or Afghanistan. We're going to update it as long as they keep the tone. Yeah, I think the original story works so well because World War II is the war that almost everyone can get behind. Mm-hmm. The good war. Yeah. Yes. We're rolling. We're just talking about Catch-22, folks. Yeah. That's what we do here in the basement sometimes. <laughs> We've had a whole episode talking about Catch-22. Oh, yeah, that's true. Unboxing commences now. This is a satellite show. Of Welcome to the basement. We get lots of mail on this show, so we open it here on unboxing. And we also thank our donors, people who go to welcometothebasementshow.com and contribute. People like these. Stephen, Chris, Tyler, Kai, Sean, JP, Graham, Kendall, Mark, Jenny, Robert, John, Graham, Christopher, Tito, Jonathan, Andrew, Corey, Paul, Danielle, Sarah, Maurizio, Bridget, Eden, Jared, Austin, Reiner, Neil, Grace, Barbara, the Harvey Brothers, Brandon, William, the Factory Boys, Scott, Wilson, Malcolm, Benjamin, Kevin, Alexander, Dan, David, Christine, Mara, Stephanie, Marie, Mario, Michael. Did you cover them all with that? Yep. That's a lot. Thank you. Let's see what missives the post has brought us. We've got this Mystery Science Theater laser blast card. I think we've gotten that one before. This is from Grace. She is a big Twilight Zone fan and has been curious if we've seen the new Jordan Peele Helm series that came out earlier this year. I haven't. I really want to. No, I haven't, but I'm also a big Twilight Zone fan. And I also like the underrated 80s Twilight Zone as well. She wants to know what episodes or themes appeal to you from the original series, or possibly from the 80s series. The one where the guy goes to the monastery in Europe, and John Carradine is there, and he plays this old monk. I have the devil in a cell! Don't let him out! Oh, wow. It's a, I'm not sure I've seen that one. It's a really intense episode. Monsters Are Due on Mabel Street is, I think, one of the best commentaries about human and American society as well. Grace also says she will be attending Serling Fest in Binghamton, New York this year, and will try and snag a postcard from the event for us. Please do. The episode's called The Howling Man. Dave and Connor from Erie, Pennsylvania. The Perry Monument, Presque Isle State Park. Hello from Erie, PA, the setting for the beginning of That Thing You Do. My son and I both love watching the show. Our buddy Jack from St. Joseph, Missouri. Homemade postcard. Oh, thank you. He's got a knack for these. Famous director David Lynch has gone on record saying, It's such a sadness that you think you've seen a film on your telephone. Get real. Mr. Lynch uses an expletive there, which I understand is rare for him. What are your thoughts on that mentality? Is the avenue in which you watch movies that important? I would never watch a movie on a phone. I would never give a first viewing of a movie on, on the phone, at least. it's uh, Of course, I don't have a phone that does that. I don't like watching YouTube videos on phones. This is for Mr. Craig Johnson. He was the life of the party last night. It's from Sean Henry, our good pal. Happy belated birthday. Hey, thanks, Sean. I lost track of dates. I was too slow off the mark to get something to you in a timely manner. So I'll smuggle this over the mail. You shouldn't use the word smuggle. You're from Canada. I'm an American. I hope you had a grand day. I did. Justin from Decatur, Illinois. Just down the road. I can't read this. On a walk of something, I swear that... I can't read this. I'm not going to read the beginning part. He says he thought he'd send this to his favorite fellas and lady with an old leather couch. Thanks for the amazing content. Hey. And lastly, Matt from Cedar Rapids, Iowa says, Unbox this, you clowns. (laughs) Ghostbusters. Yeah. Who am I going to call? These guys. Let's open some packages. All right. Why don't you unwrap that one from Sean, because it might be for you. I think it is, yes. Thomas Alva Edison may have invented the phonograph, but Thomas Alva Epley has sent me a phonograph recording. Are you just guessing that? I'm just guessing. When he came across this, he knew he had to pass it along to me. A forgotten artifact needs to be rediscovered. That is I Stand Alone by Al Cooper. Hmm, Al Cooper, who I believe was a musician for a lot of key Bob Dylan songs. Yep, and he was also in the original Blood, Sweat, and Tears. He played organ on uh, like, a Rolling, like Stone. a Rolling Stone. Didn't know how to play it. No. He faked his way into the studio. And But that's what makes the song great. It's that little pause at, like right before I record. There we go, Al Cooper. I have that first Blood, Sweat, and Tears record, and I really like it. And I wanted to hear more by this guy, because it's it's sort of like intricate music. Mm-hmm. Here we have Al Cooper's first solo album, and on the cover is Cooper as Lady Liberty, 
in a juxtaposition Abby Hoffman would have killed to come up with. What's that creeping around the balcony up at the torch? Is that another tiny Al Cooper looking like one of the characters from the Spy vs. Spy comics? <laughs> I think it is. This is him eating the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> the professor, Sean Henry, sends this. Being a great admirer of Robert Louis Stevenson, of course, I had to send along a copy of Treasure Island after you admitted you hadn't read it. I've also included Kidnapped, which I might like even more. I hope you enjoy them. And that no one tips you the black spot. Well, show off that postcard. Oh, here's the postcard of a woman looking eye to eye with an eye. Nice. Wow. Since the Treasure Island episode, I've read Treasure Island. So, that one goes to Matt. Hey! So there's another story that goes along with this. And the ebb tide. Well, I'll be taking Kidnapped. Mark from Fulton, New York, sends us some more souvenirs from his journeys. My girlfriend Ginny and I continued our vacation by going to Nashville, Tennessee. Ah. Postcards, Nashville. The Parthenon. I remember when we went there. Oh, we did. The Nashville Zoo. Did not go there. And the Nashville Zoo. See? The wind. (laughs) (laughs) You guys send us questions, and sometimes we answer them. Actually, we answer them on every episode, but we only do two usually. Therese from Down Under says, How much can you forgive a director when the acting is shit? And she cites Ryan O'Neill in Barry Lyndon, a movie we watched together. Yes. I don't think he was that bad in that. I don't. You see, that, so that throws off the yeah, thing. There's a weird way that that role suited him, and mm-hmm. he suited that role. I had a professor in college, uh, and this was during the time that Tom Cruise was trapped in England working on Eyes Wide Shut. Tom Cruise in a Kubrick movie... And my director said, we thought the same thing 25 years ago when Ryan O'Neill was cast in Barry Lyndon. And uh, Lyndon is innocent and cocky enough that he makes that character work. So the question is, how much can you, can you blame a director? Um, I, I, I don't know. A lot of times directors don't necessarily have control over who's in their movie, especially if they're a first-time director. Mm-hmm. There are casting directors involved. I'm not sure what a casting director actually does. Yeah. Podcast movie. And also, you know, producers have a hand in that. Jesse Minster writes, What are some of your favorite music videos? Not just my favorite, but the one I will say is the best music video of all time is Groove is in the Heart by yeah. D-Light. That video is perfect. D-Light's video is so specifically them. It's so perfectly suited for them. And it's so funny and weird and strange. And because they're so kitschy and campy, the video can never go out of style. I'm going to cheat. My favorite music video is not really a music video. It's a YouTube music video. And it's Bruno Mars' Uptown Funk with all of the clips from the old musicals cut Mm -hmm. in. And it's all synced up. I think I've watched that 20 times. We have a P.O. box where people send us little things. Sean Henry sends books. (laughs) Other people send postcards. (laughs) And a lot of people send records. I make an effort to listen to them as much as I can. So I'm going to talk about some of them today. The theme is mystery. These are four records. I've never heard of the people who make it. I have no idea what the music sounds like. And we're going to play a little game. We're going to look at the record, and I'm going to tell you my thoughts on what I think it's going to sound like based on the appearance, and then what it actually sounds like. First of all, we have Labi Cifre. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. That's how I pronounce it, because I took high school French. Remember my song. Now I look at this, and I'm thinking jazz. Mm -hmm. Like barrel house jazz, because this guy's really giving me a Jelly Roll Morton vibe. But you said something when we first got this that maybe it wants you to think that this is jazz. There's a song on here that's been sampled by a bunch of hip-hop people, Wu-Tang Clan, Eminem. So I'm guessing it's soul and funk. And that's pretty much what it is. There's not a lot of funk on here. I think there may be two funk cuts, and the rest of it is kind of soul ballads. Lots of strings, lots of orchestration. The guy's voice, at times, he kind of sounds like George Harrison. At times, he sounds like Cat Stevens. Mm. And just really sort of melancholy soul ballads. It's nice stuff. I like this a lot. And in case you're curious, the sample in question, it's from the uh, Eminem Slim Shady song, the like, that's the sample. Okay, we've got Larry and his flask. I look at this and I'm thinking this is going to be kind of throwback rural music, like perhaps the Bad Livers or Hank 3 or the Carolina Chocolate Drops. There's a song on here called West Virginia Chocolate Drop. 
I listen to this, it's kind of like that. This is really high energy music, and it has more kind of a gypsy jazz vibe. And one song, the ska horns show up. It's really weird. Basically what it comes down to is that this is rock and roll with banjos and accordions. Next up, we have Atom and his package. A society of people named Elihu. This is very whimsical. On the back it says a portion of the proceeds will be donated to LBGT charities. So from the pictures, from the song titles, which are pretty funny, Sting cannot possibly be the same guy that was in the police. Things like that. I'm guessing this guy is sort of a gay Harmar superstar <laughs> or MC Paul Barman or maybe a one man they might be giants. And listening to this, that pretty much nails it. He's more of a one man dead milkman. And now we come to possibly the most intriguing of the four records I'm talking about today. And that's by the Marshmallow Ghosts and the Spooky Sideshow The Scariest Things You've Ever Heard. <laughs> First of all, I want to show off this. This is a one-sided LP. What? And the, and the second side has this. I thought that this is going to be maybe some dark folk or dark, just dark music of some sort. And at a certain point, I worried that this is one of those records where you listen to it and it makes you insane. <laughs> this is a Halloween record. I think this is the type of record that you put on at the Halloween party and everyone just listens to it. It starts off with a very scary voiced man who he's a doctor and he's blind, but he has an inner eye that sees and he goes about recording the scariest sounds anyone's ever heard. It's very strange. There's music on here. It's sort of moody electronic music. And then the doctor comes back. I was at a sideshow and they had a tent where there was a woman who turned into a werewolf. And so he records her transformation. But that's really the only scary sound on the other whole record. So is it maybe something that, like, on Halloween night, trick-or-treaters are coming, you just put a speaker in the window and you drop the needle? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. But this is also the sort of thing you kind of have to listen to the whole thing. It's very weird. I don't know who made this. If anybody knows anything about these people, tell me. Or tell me and I'll tell Matt. Let's open those packages. All right. Take then. the one on top. You can take the one on the bottom. From uh, Fred in Clearwater, Florida. This is from Timothy in Hamilton, Ontario. It's not just an album. It's a movie star. The Revenge of Bruno by Bruce Willis. You said Revenge of Bruno. It's actually a return of Bruno, but Revenge may as well be the title. Yes. We look forward to the blue stylings of John McClane. Tim says, if you didn't recognize my name on the address, I'm the one who sent you those Klaatu records. I remember those. I recently relocated to a new house close to my new job and three used record stores. Oh, oh man. Where the hell did he, does he live? The 90s? I figured I would share my fortunes with you. There are two bags. One is well worth listening to. The other is just silly. <laughs> Try to guess which is which. Okay, Hammer City Records. I'm not sure if this is silly or well worth, but it's two split ends records. Mm. True Colors and Waiata. I would say that this one is worth it. Show it out of its sleeve. Oh, wow. Wow. What? Look at the surface of that. Oh, I don't know if that's showing. I'm not sure it's showing up, but... Uh, yeah. Is that a hologram? They didn't have holograms since Split Ends was coming around. They got something. Yeah, something magical. I hope you can there. see that. Oh, yeah. Keep jupiting it around like that. Jupiting it around, Tony says. Jupiting it. It's a word now. This is the silly one, I'm guessing. We've got the Hawaiian surfers today. Today? Disco Italiano. Disco Italiano is actually a whole music genre. I thought this was an Ital disco compilation, then I read the track list. Gene Ferrari and the Disco Roma Band. Oh, the theme from The Godfather. <laughs> Mondo Kane theme. We've made a lot of episodes of Ultimate the Basement. Maybe you have seen a bunch of episodes, but have forgotten to check out this one that Matt's about to tell you about. I'm going to recommend an episode from our previous season, and it is The Adventures of Elmo in Grouchland. If you are an adult without kids, you will never watch this movie. But this movie has some really nice moments, and so you should watch us watching it on our show. Mandy Patinkin's in it. Can't be all bad. Plus, it's got your favorite Sesame Street Muppets, and who doesn't like that? Mm -hmm. There is a button at the end of this video that you can click, and you can watch that episode if you choose. And right now, you can watch this. <laughs> 